the court will now take up the last case on the docket, Laboratory Corporation of America versus Davis. Counsel. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Kate Stetson. I am arguing this morning on behalf of the petitioners, Sheridan and LabCorp, and I've reserved five minutes for rebuttal. The respondent in this case, Patty Davis, filed a class action lawsuit against LabCorp and Sheridan when she received bills for medical treatments that should have been sent to her employer's insurance carrier. Ms. Davis brought that lawsuit under the Florida Consumer Collection Practices Act. And her argument was that because the state's workers' compensation law prohibits providers from billing employees directly for medical treatments, that Sheridan and LabCorp had violated the FCCPA in sending their bills to her rather than to her employer's carrier. But this court recognized some time ago in Sanders versus City of Orlando that the state's workers' compensation law contains a broad exclusive jurisdiction provision. And it's section 440.1311C, which says among other things that the department has, and I'll quote, exclusive jurisdiction to decide any matters concerning reimbursement, close quote. Uh, Council, let, let me ask you this. Um, just a, a, a variation on the facts here. Say that this all went the way it went, except that Ms. Davis actually paid the bill. Um, she paid the provider. Um, so maybe she wasn't represented by an attorney and she thought, well, I've got to pay it. Um, and then later she found out that that was wrong, that it was, a, that it was an illegal uh, uh, the, the sending of the bill to her was uh, contrary to law uh, and she sought to get it back. Is there a mechanism for the department to adjudicate her claim to get that money back? My understanding, Mr. Chief Justice, is that in circumstances where the employee has mistakenly paid a medical bill that should have been channeled to the insurance carrier, that that actually goes through the office of the judges of compensation claims. Because at that point, the employee is essentially seeking a return of money. So that's over kind of in, in that category of claims. So still- well, so, so that would not, so this, this matter about the department having exclusive jurisdiction to decide uh, any matter uh, concerning reimbursement would not apply to that. I think it would not apply to that only because of the of the breakdown between what the judges of compensation claims have authority over and what the department has authority over. The judges of compensation claims, of course, do have particularized authority over certain aspects of the workers' compensation scheme. Well, the, the circuit courts have particularized authority over claims under the FCCPA. Isn't that correct? I would describe them as having authority over claims under the FCCPA, but just because that statute exists, I think that just begs the question about whether this well, particular I, claim I, exists. I, but what I'm, I'm, I struggle here with understanding how the circuit court can be ousted of jurisdiction under this provision related to ex exclusive jurisdiction to decide matters that's vested in the department, if it's a matter that's not, that can't be adjudicated by the department. It seems like the, 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 um, the reference to exclusive jurisdiction would have to be premised on an understanding that the department actually has jurisdiction over the particular matter that is going to be decided. No, but I, I'd like to be very clear, Mr. Chief Justice, Ms. Ms. Davis didn't pay any money. Her complaint- Well, I understand that, I understand that, but I, but, but it's the same, it's essentially the same question. Uh, it's, a, it's about the relationship of the authority of the department to adjudicate matters that are specifically like a dispute between the, uh, uh, the provider and the, uh, and, and the employee, which is not, which you've already conceded they don't really have. And you know, when we look, if, if, when I look at the statute, uh, up in, in 11A, uh, it contemplates that sometimes an, a, a, uh, a provider is going to receive a payment that they, they shouldn't receive, um, and it, but it specifically provides that the healthcare provider has received payment from a carrier 
for services that were improperly billed and the, uh, and the so on, uh, it must return those payments to the carrier. There's no similar provision uh, with respect to an employee who's improperly billed, is there? Uh, there, there is indeed, and it's contained in the rules, Chief Justice Kennedy. If you look at the rules that, that uh, under which the department executes its authority under 440.1311A, exactly the statute that you're talking about, rule 69L-34.001 specifically defines a violation of this statute as, and I quote, collecting or receiving payment from an injured worker in violation of the statute. Rule 69L34.003 provides that a person such as Ms. Davis can report a violation of the workers' compensation law to the division's offices, Office of Medical Services, and it, is, it specifically identifies as one piece of supporting documentation that that person can attach, copies of collection letters sent to the injured worker from the provider or a collection agent acting on behalf of the provider seeking payment for covered medical services. So there's really no dispute, Your Honor, in this case that reimbursement is payment for covered medical services. The only dispute between the parties is whether that word reimbursement somehow attaches only to requests for payment between the provider well, and the let me, let, this, Okay, let me ask you another question and then I'll give my colleagues a chance to answer questions. But you're talking about reimbursement. Now, if, let me give you a hypothetical related to the, the ordinary use of that term. Um, if my daughter, who is away at college, uh, tells me that she received a bill from her physician, uh, and ask should uh, should uh, she pay it? I'm not going to say, yeah, go ahead and reimburse the doctor. I might say to her, you can pay it, and I will reimburse you. Uh, that's the way that term is ordinarily used in that context. So I'm just I'm struggling to understand how how this how a payment a, a bill from a provider. Uh, is a demand for re uh, to the, the patient who received the services is a demand for reimbursement and or that the a, a payment made after such a demand would be a reimbursement payment. That just doesn't seem to be the way the English language is used. I, I think, for, first of all, unfortunately, sometimes in the workers' compensation and health arenas, uh, the English language is used in particularized ways, as we know. But second and more important, you know, a request for reimbursement, if we all agree, as we do, that a request for reimbursement running from a provider to a carrier, that bill, you pay me for X, is a request for reimbursement. There is nothing different in quality between that request and the request to the employee. And if well, we can- I, I, don't under, I don't understand that argument at all. So because there is, there's a clearly established sense of, of this, uh, of that reimbursement includes indemnification, uh, things such as that. So where there was a third party involved and, and that is not, uh, the same as a demand for payment from the person who received the services. I just, I, I don't. I, I, let me, I, let me try to go at this another way then, Mr. Chief Justice, and I'd refer you to two provisions in particular, 440.131Q, which is the definition of reimbursement dispute. And I'd like you to consider it next to 440.133G. And I'll start with 1Q, reimbursement dispute means any disagreement between a healthcare provider or healthcare facility and carrier concerning payment for medical treatment. That is the definition of a dispute about reimbursement, a dispute over payment for medical treatment. Turn to 440.133G. The employee is not liable for payment for medical treatment. So in this statute, and this is something that I think actually Mr. Gowdy and I largely agree on. It's just a question of who the X and Y are when you talk about paying X, X paying Y. A reimbursement in this statute is a payment for medical treatment. And if we're going to play the kind of math uh, exercise that Mr. Gowdy does in his brief, we can look at the number of times that a payment to a provider is discussed in the context of talking about a carrier's obligation to pay a provider. Ms. So Stephen, the short path through- I, could, yes. Excuse me, could I go in a different direction and talk about the FCCPA under which um, this plaintiff sued? Um, you recognize that that has a civil remedies provision in it, 559.77, is that correct? 
It does have a civil remedies that, provision. That yes. was the basis for suit. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And it, it says that any person who fails to comply with any provision of 559.72, which defines the, the unfair debt collection practices, is liable for actual damages and for additional statutory damages as the court may allow, and with a limit, together with costs and reasonable attorney's fees. And then it goes on to uh, contemplate a class action lawsuit. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is all correct, I believe. Okay. Um, and it's clear from this statute and unambiguous, you know, any person that that your client would fit within that. They would be subject to this suit if they, um, according to this statute, if they violated the terms of 559.72. Is that what the statute says? There, I think I have to start parting ways with you, Justice Lawson. And I mean, is that what this statute says? Let's not look at any other statute. She's suing under this statute. This statute says any person. Would you agree that it says that your client is subject to suit for this? I would agree that my client would be any person. I think perhaps where I'd have to start parting ways with you is whether this is a, this is a consumer debt, which is not a question that's in this case. The point that I would make, though, Justice Lawson. But the allegation is that that your client failed to comply with a provision of 559.72, correct? That is correct. And that's okay. exactly the that's exactly the allegation that the plaintiff in Einhorn. Okay. Sorry, go and, ahead. And it's it, the statute says that it, the court's going to adjudicate this. And you would agree that there's no provision in 440 or anywhere else for anybody other than circuit court to adjudicate a action under 559.77, correct? There is no provision in the workers' compensation law for a court to adjudicate a no, for the, anybody else. For the Department of Finance, can't can't authorize the um, statutory damages, attorneys' fees for a violation of of the consume the debt collection act. That's correct, and that's our point. Yes. Okay, but there's a statute that says that the circuit court can adjudicate that claim. Correct. There is that the general debt collection statute does say that. Yes. Was the plaintiff seeking reimbursement for anything in that action or was the plaintiff seeking the statutory damages, court costs and other uh, damages outlined in the civil remedies provision? In, in this action, I think the plaintiff was was bringing a class action on behalf of herself. And but was, was, was reimbursement for anything an issue? No, because she no, was, yeah, right, yeah. So, so why, why, why is what the term reimbursement in a different statute means if if the plaintiff brought a claim under this act for the statutory damages provided in this act and made all the allegations that this statute says constitute a cause of action for damages under this act? Because, Justice Lawson, of that broad, exclusive jurisdiction language that I mentioned, it says any matter concerning reimbursement. It doesn't say any matter concerning reimbursement where the reimbursement has been made. Okay, After aren't we all, supposed when you talk to about harmonize the law, harmonize various statutes if absolutely. they relate to one another? Yes. And, yes. and I'm having a struggle understanding why when one statute is clear and unambiguous and gives everybody who's subject to an unfair debt collection practices act, a cause of action with statutorily defined damages against anybody who violates the act, we would be, I mean, it would seem to, if we're going to harmonize these statutes, there would be have to be something as express and clear as is in 559, such as a, a worker's compensate, you know, someone who's subject to worker's compensation benefits cannot take advantage of the civil remedies provision and 559 they they just are are out of luck and, and are subject to um consumer debt collection unfair consumer debt collection practices i mean i mean it, why wouldn't a specific exemption be necessary to ignore the plain language of 559.77 which obviously gives a remedy for a couple different reasons, Justice Lawson. The first is the workers' compensation law and the exclusive jurisdiction provision, which gives the department jurisdiction over any matters concerning reimbursement. That was in place, <clears throat> excuse me, long before the FCCPA. And of course, this court recognizes and understands the doctrine of implied repeal. There is nothing in the FCCPA that acts to deprive 
the department of the exclusive jurisdiction that it has over a matter concerning reimbursement, which this is simply- but, but, but this lawsuit is a matter concerning an, an unfair debt collection practice for statutory damages that have nothing to do with the reimbursement or anything related to the workers' comp statute. Justice right? Lawson, that, that is precisely the argument that the plaintiff in Einhorn made. The plaintiff in Einhorn, which we cite at page 25 of our initial brief, brought an FCCPA case against her health insurer, claiming that the health insurer had essentially overshot a lien that it was entitled to under the Medicare Act. And what the court in Einhorn held was that because the Medicare Act specifically channels those types of complaints through an administrative procedure, the court did not have jurisdiction. It lacked jurisdiction under the FCCPA to administer that. So how does a different statute channel a complaint that your client violated the Unfair Debt Collection Practices Act anywhere other than circuit court? I think, Justice Lawson, the, the, the point that you and I are, are really joining issue on is that you, you are framing this case exactly as the plaintiff has framed it. This is In a their complaint case. under the statute. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Our point is that no matter what label you put on this, you can call it a debt collection case and you can try to bring a claim under the FCCPA just as the plaintiff did in Einhorn. What this is at bottom is a matter concerning reimbursement because this complaint is about Ms. Davis getting a bill that should have been sent to her insurance care, to her employer's insurance carrier. That I'm is sorry. a matter concerning reimbursement. I'm sorry to interrupt you and, and welcome to our court. Um, it seems like your argument, as I understand it, is almost like a preemption argument. And it sort of, you're kind of asking us to read the, the uh, 11C passage that you're relying on literally but if you look at the act itself, even just this section where in 5D, it talks about the employee may appeal to a judge of compensation claims for reimbursement when the employer or carrier withholds payment. And then in 12, you have this three member panel, which is not the department, it's aided by the department, but it's not the department. So within this, within this uh, provision itself, we have examples of other entities making decisions about matters that are, you know, about reimbursement. And so it seems like you're asking us to read the 11C phrase literally when in the act itself, we know that it's not, it can't be read literally and make the act make sense. And so it seems like really the issue is why, why is, is, does this case involve a quote unquote decision about a matter, you know, of the type that is exclusively for the department? Justice Moniz, I think, I think the answer is that while, while there are instances where a workers' compensation issue is channeled by that workers' compensation statute into a different place, so that you can essentially read exclusive jurisdiction to decide any matters concerning reimbursement with that in mind, because it's within the same statute, the, the emphasis, I think, should not be on decide. That's never where the parties have joined issue. The emphasis on any and concerning and reimbursement. Any, of course, as this court has recognized many times, means any. Concerning is very broad, and reimbursement means payment from one person to another. That's what the statute specifically says in those two provisions that I read to you earlier, 13.1Q and 13.3G. Reimbursement means payment for medical services rendered, full stop. Is there anything, so this, so, so this is kind of a process sort of who decides thing. Is there anything substantively in the workers' comp law that would suggest to us that essentially, you know, to the extent the department can police overbilling or improper billing and that sort of thing, that essentially those remedies are the only ones available in this kind of context and that they displace any sort of consumer protection type remedy that might be found elsewhere. Because it really seems like that, it's almost like a sort of field preemption type thing that it seems like we would have to buy into the side with you more so than just looking at this language, you know, for the reasons that that I laid out. Right, and, and first of all, I'm, I'm cognizant that I may be eating into my rebuttal and, time. Counsel, and we, uh, you are, actually, you have exhausted it. <laughs> so, but what will, if you'll answer this question yes. briefly, um, I will, uh, uh, even though the time's been gone, I'll nonetheless afford you three minutes of rebuttal time. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Justice Meniz, I, th I think the answer to your question lies in Sanders itself. I, I don't think that this case is properly described as any kind of a preemption case. That's not the way that it's ever been framed. It's not the way the trial courts address this when they address the issue. It's a jurisdictional case. And as this court said in Sanders, every Article V court to have looked at this issue has noticed, had noted the broad and exclusive jurisdiction provision in the workers' compensation statutes. I don't think you need to do any more kind of magic or math than that. I think the answer lies in the plain text of the statute. When the department has exclusive jurisdiction over any matters concerning reimbursement, and this is a request for reimbursement for medical services, the department has exclusive jurisdiction over it. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chief Justice. All right, counsel. Good morning. May it please the court. Brian Gowdy on behalf of the injured worker, Ms. Davis. Um, the key word here is reimbursement. Uh, every reimbursement is a payment, but not every payment is a reimbursement. Just as every poodle is a dog, but not every dog is a poodle. Let's compare reimbursement with other words used for payment. For example, disbursement. The ordinary way these two words are commonly used differ, though both mean a payment in some sense. A disbursement, which in its Latin and French roots meant a payment from a purse, occurs when one party, usually from a fund, pays a second party for goods or services or to fulfill a legal obligation or for some other particular purpose. In contrast, the word here, reimbursement, which at its Latin and French roots meant a payment into a purse, occurs when a third party indemnifies a second party for goods or services or payment that the second party previously provided to, the, to a first party. The central flaw in the provider's argument is that based on their own sense of the word and nothing else, they assume that every use of the word payment is a reimbursement. So what's the sense of the word concerning? The sense if of the any, word any is used matter in this. concerning. I'm sorry, I didn't. I, any matter concerning. Any matter concerning is broad. And I don't think that's where the debate here is. And you don't I mean, deny that the claim, part of proving your claim in, in this parallel in the FCC whatever action that you would for part of that would be establishing that in fact the carrier had the reimbursement obligation and not your client and that in the, the debt collector knew that and that's what made it improper etc so it's it, I mean there's no way that you can decouple the reimbursement issue from that claim I I, I... I don't entirely agree. Uh, I'll take, I'll, let me, I'll part ways with you part, partly on that. Uh, we clearly are relying on section or paragraph 3G, which says the employee is not liable for payment for medical treatment or services. Um, the problem that the, my opponent has is she wants to link that use of payment in 3G with how it's used in 1Q which is where we're talking about a reimbursement dispute. And in that context, in 1Q, it's clearly talking about between a provider and a carrier. Right, but I think the weakest part of your argument is that even if you accept the narrow definition of reimbursement that you're advocating, the dispute, the consumer collection dispute still relates to that issue. It still concerns that issue. And you know, there's case law that, you know, that I think is cited in the briefs that talks about how the word concerning is very broad. And so it can, even if the reimbursement is referring to the carrier and provider, it still concerns that in, in, at its heart as it's an essential aspect of it. Well, I, 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 would, I don't think that's entirely true, especially if you look under everything in 559.72, including some of our claims here. Um, and I, I, Justice, Chief, the Chief Justice actually beat me to it with his hypothetical that he started with, uh, where if Ms. Davis had paid the uh, bill and then later learned that the carrier um, had also paid the bill, um, the natural thing for Ms. Davis to do would be to go to, if the carrier refused to, to reimburse her, well, refund her, I guess I should say, to be accurate, 
um, then the natural thing would be a, a common law claim for unjust enrichment or quantum merit. Wouldn't that, the easier thing be to pick up the phone and call the department and say I was improperly billed and you need to get my money back for me? I mean, I, I don't. I think that it's clear that whether the, whether this is an exclusive remedy or not, it seems like if you just draw a circle around the workers' comp system itself, the rules and the statute do account for this kind of problem. We don't have to invent a consumer protection law or a common law action to try to fix this problem. Well, I, I have lots of other examples that I think will undermine your point, Justice Muniz. Um, suppose that the provider uh, uh, d decided to make, uh, uh, to threaten with force for this payment. That, that would be actionable not only under the FCCPA, but under the common law for assault or if the battery was committed in the connection with it. Those claims are now out too under the provider's reading of, of 44.1311C. I understand. Um, so, I, and this is where I think it does get to the question of, is this, you know, within sort of the way this statute uses decisions, you know, about matters concerning reimbursement. I mean, one way to look at this is that it's just a sort of garden variety dispute over within the workers' comp system who is supposed to pay. I don't know that we need to get into you know, hypotheticals about people threatening to beat each other up or whatever that are clearly outside of a workers' comp context to answer and, or ask the question about, is this the type of dispute that's being referred to in this provision? But the, the language that you're giving to it and the providers are giving to it foreclose all these other actions, Your Honor, because you're saying, well, because it's a matter concerning reimbursement, if, if a provider were to threaten force to collect a payment, an unlawful payment, that would, under your, under the provider's reading, would be a matter concerning reimbursement. Can, 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 of, can, I, can, I, can I ask you? Can I ask you on this? Is there, is there any dispute about who should have paid this bill? That's not. That's that. Who was supposed to pay this bill? Is that an issue at all in this case, or is that essentially conceded? Well, I'm, I mean, we're we're this is a we're here on a motion for judgment on the pleadings. I would hope the providers would concede that. I'd have to go back and review the answer whether they admitted that or not, Your Honor. I mean, it seems it, the answer should be there should be no dispute, but I could I, you, maybe you can ask my opponent on that. We we were very early in this case. Um, but for the for the legal question that we're having to answer here, it really doesn't matter because, you know, I mean, there are situations where, for example, if if care isn't authorized in advance or whatever, it's not per se wrong for something that could be in, implicated in workers comp where you, where there could properly be a bill that would be sent to the patient. And so you're, you're sort of you really are you can't get away from the need to kind of in order to prove this claim, you kind of have to dig into the workers' comp law and figure out who was responsible for the payment and et cetera, et cetera. You can't, you can't, it may be obvious in some cases, but it still has to be decided. I, I look, I, we're not trying to run away from the fact that the, that the claim involves the workers' comp law. If, there were, if Ms. Davis was not an injured worker uh, and she was just going to see a provider uh, independent, then the provider would, might have a legitimate a legitimate debt. So it, yes, I agree with you on that, Your Honor. But the question here is whether uh, an executive branch agency is all of a sudden going to have jurisdiction, adjudicatory jurisdiction, to decide uh, a dispute between Miss Davis, the injured worker, and the provider. And I think, but I think what the other side would say, though, and this was one of the issues I had with your brief, is that they're not saying that the department is going to decide a consumer protection action and award in response to Justice Lawson's question and, you know, apply that statute. They're basically saying that that type of dispute just is not because of the way the workers' comp system works, that in this context, this type of billing issue is off the table and has to be handled within the workers' comp framework. But that's the that's the problem with their argument, because if you look at everything else in 11C, Your Honor, they are deciding disputes. Everything else in 11C, overutilization, and this happens, and we put the we put the forms in there for you to see. Um, when the provider and the carrier don't agree on the billing, 
they go to this procedure that the department has set up. So it is an adjudicatory function, but it just doesn't have any room at all for uh, the injured worker. So I dis it, it, it's, it's disingenuous to say that we're, the, the, the purpose of this language is to somehow preclude Ms. Davis from an unjust enrichment claim or an FCCPA claim when everything else under 11C is to actually allow carriers to contest if providers are overbilling or providers to say we're not being paid enough. So everybody else gets to have an, a day in the department rather than court except the injured worker. And that's, an, that's just not a reasonable reading of the, uh, any matters concerning reimbursement, especially as we've gone through in our brief. Uh, when you consider that reimbursement, you can look it up in multiple dictionaries, it's defined as indemnity. And indemnity inherent in that is that it's a three-party transaction. So there is a third-party requirement. It's, in, it's intrinsic in the word. I think it's pretty clear, though, in the workers' comp law that they kind of interchangeably use the word pay and reimbursement throughout the statute. I, that's, well, I would, that's I, I, your, your honor, I agree. And that goes back to my hypothetical at the beginning. A reimbursement is a payment. But in this context that it's being used here, you're not collecting a reimbursement from the injured worker. It's payment it, it, being it, it, used it, in a different sense. It seems different to me to have a situation where there is an argument about whether something should be covered under workers' compensation in the first instance, or even a dispute about the amount. And in those cases, it seems like the statute where it goes to the uh, agency and decided by a judge of compensation claims would correctly decide those type issues. But here, as I understand the facts, that the uh, lab was put on notice that it was covered by workers' comp blew past that and sent uh, in these instances it, for debt collection to a collection agency and threatened them with their credit being ruined if they didn't pay. That seems more squarely under the consumer protections statute. So it seems like those are different type scenarios. And what we have here is more properly under the consumer protection statute. Yes, I, I agree. And there's and and the, the two statutes, I would agree with Justice Lawson, they can be easily reconciled. If you give reimbursement, the sense it's used uh, 47 times in the in the statute, it's always used to talk about when a third party is paying a second party uh, to compensate for something the second party either provided in terms of goods or services or paid. Um, and the, the providers try to parse like there's these different uses. There's not a single time in the statute that, uh, I'm have it here, uh, it's Which never used. Your argument, you're basically well. reading, you're reading the statute as if it said, the department has exclusive jurisdiction to decide reimbursement disputes. See the defined term reimbursement dispute. And for better or worse, and who knows if it was intentional or not, that's not what the statute says. I'm not reading the statute like that, Your Honor. Your Honor. I'm reading it for reimbursement matters. And uh, while I get your point that you're not that, and this is the point you made is not something the providers have argued up to this point, but there's a whole host of things that go under subsection 12. And the head of that panel is the chief of the fin chief financial officer. And that has to deal with setting the prices. So, and there's a footnote in the second DCA opinion that uh, acknowledges this. You can have, you have reimbursement disputes between providers and carriers. That's one type of reimbursement matter. And then the chief financial officer and this panel with the assistance of the department sets the statewide schedules. And that's how the word reimbursement is used 31 times. Right, in but, but in section 12, I mean, that's that is not talking about the department. So, but to get to Justice Bolston's point, it seems like what you're saying is that the jurisdictional question would turn on whether one of the elements of the claim is disputed or not. And that, that doesn't sound right. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, and I disagree with your honor, 
to say that Section 12 is not part of the department's purview. There's a three-member panel created that consists of the chief financial officer or his designee and two members to be appointed by the govern governor subject to confirmation by the Senate. And then that panel determines statewide schedules of maximum reimbursement allowances. Right, so where it talks about the department assisting and giving information to the panel, it's, it's assisting itself? The, the department, it, well, the chief financial officer who's the head of the department, yes. And this panel that's within the department is my fair reading of this. Did you ask, never, did the you providers are not- The fictional question though. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Justice Polston was talking to you about the about this particular claim and the fact that it was uncontested that uh, that the bill was improperly sent and whatever. But that seems like it kind of would tie whether there's jurisdiction or not to whether, in fact, there's a dispute as to whether the bill was properly sent in the first place. I don't agree because the the um, the de the determination you know if the JCC or there's some other, uh, you know, not every case is litigated, right? If there's some other determination that workers' comp benefits are available, uh, then, you know, that will, that will determine the issue. Now, if it turned out that Mrs. Ms. Davis, you know, wasn't really an injured worker and she made it all up or something, well, then I guess we would be litigating that, but we'd still be litigating it in the court. Um, and, uh, the, I go back to the provider's uh, argument would, would mean that uh, providers could impersonate law enforcement and there'd be no remedy. Providers could use or threaten force or violence and there'd be no remedy. Counsel, can, well, can counsel, break, counsel let me, uh, when you uh, mentioned the, the, uh, the employee making it all up, uh, am I, would I be right in understanding the argument but your understanding of the argument that account, opposing counsel is making is that if you had circumstances where the employer made it all up, committed fraud, uh, there's a fraudulent claim that, that is obviously related to claims for reimbursement, but it's all fraudulent, that that would be a matter exclusively within the department's jurisdiction. And even though crimes were committed uh, by, in, uh, through perjured testimony or whatever else. That, uh, that, that is the natural, that is the natural endpoint for the provider's argument. Yes, Chief Justice. All those things would go to the department. And, you know, the department has- Well, the department filed, can't really adjudicate those things. I no, mean, they're not. If you go, you're, they haven't filed a brief supporting this uh, argument that the providers have made. Um, I think if you were to call up the department and ask them this, um, they would be shocked to know that they're all of a sudden have all these things. They're certainly not equipped for it. What they're equipped to deal with is utilization and overbilling disputes between physicians and carriers. What about, um, what, what about the, the point made at page 24 and 25 of the initial brief here? This is the Einhorn point that we were talking about earlier, where the, as it happens, the statute uh, the workers' compensation statute actually requires carriers to report instances of improper billing. Wouldn't that make this the kind of case where actually they do contemplate this being within their end? But I mean, I, I, I see your thrust, the, the thrust of the argument that, you know, there's really no end point if we, if we if read the, the statute very broadly and say, well, what about a crime? What about, but, but don't, don't we take from the rules in the code, the fact that this type of dispute was precisely supposed to be brought to the attention of the department to mean something. Right, so I don't deny that the department has investigatory powers, classic executive branch powers, and they can investigate these things. But, but that doesn't mean they have adjudicatory powers, which really goes to my last argument. If you accept this, the department has all three branches powers. They get to write rules, they get to, which is making law, legislative. They get to enforce and do investigations, executive, and they have adjudicatory powers. And while we've greatly expanded since the New Deal what agencies can do, that seems like a bit much to me, and I don't think that's what the legislature intended. So everything you're saying, Justice Coriel, I agree the department can investigate, just like if 
um, if a provider committed some criminal activity that, that the Chief Justice just mentioned, well, then certainly you could call the state attorney's office too, and they would be able to investigate. But that doesn't mean that you don't have a private remedy for a battery or an assault. Um, I did, I see my time is running out. I didn't know if I was going to get any more, uh, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, but I will get a little more since the opposing counsel is going to get a little more. Thank, thank you. But um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Justice Coriel, on the Einhorn case, um, that's uh, Judge Bloom for the Southern District of Florida, a single judge. It's dealing with the Medicare statutes. Um, and the, the language there, I think, is substantially yeah, different. No, it's, it, it's, it's a CF site, though. And the structure of, of the argument, though, is the same, which is that if there's, you know, it, it, if there is a, um, uh, a, a structure in the workers' comp law, as there is in the Medicare law, um, why shouldn't we understand that to communicate an intention on the part of, or not an intention, a, a meaning of the words that the, that the legislature enacted, that this is what we, this is uh, a requirement that you use this dispute resolution mechanism. I guess that's the argument that I wanted yeah, to Yeah, I guess my, my response would be reread my answer brief, but, but the language matters. And the Einhorn case isn't talking about the statutory language here. It's talking about different language under the Medicare uh, act and uh, you know so I, I don't know what else to tell you other than uh, reimbursement doesn't mean what the providers are, are saying and it also doesn't make sense from the perspective that we're going to need to it, it, it is giving the department adjudicatory authority over this dispute for something it's not equipped to deal with um, and doesn't deal with you can't if you read their forms, they won't allow a uh, Ms. Davis to file a petition in their dispute resolution process. So, I, you know, I think it, to me, it's obvious that matters is reimbursement disputes and everything else under subsection 12, which isn't a dispute that deals with setting the price. <clears throat> um, I don't know if that answers your question, Justice Coriel, but I, I, I just, different language matters. And I don't see how the language is similar here. Um, I did. Uh, I mean, in 5D, they use the word reimbursement to talk about the employee wanting money from the carrier. So I don't under, you keep saying language matters. I mean. Sure. So in, fi in 5D, um, that is the, that is the one, uh, slightly different wrinkle, but it's still an it's still being used in the context of indemnity. What's happening there is that the employee, that the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the carrier can require the employee to reimburse the carrier for the payment it had to make to the IME uh, for uh, it's a no-show no fee. It, it's a no-show fee, but th that's a classic meaning of reimbursement. Because, yeah. because the, car the carrier pays it, and then the the um, uh, the employee has to cough up a part of it to, to reimburse the carrier for what the carrier has already paid. And what? Right? Yeah. Well, actually, I, I think the five D though it's an odd placement for the sentence, but it seems to be going beyond just the no-show fee because they're talking about withholding payment. Uh, the employer or carrier withholding payment. They're not talking about the employee withholding the reimbursement. Well, it, it's used twice, Justice Muniz. One, and I think I'm running out of time. One, it uses the word reimburse for the no-show fee. And then the second time it uses, and if I could just read this sentence, Chief Justice, and I'll conclude, uh, the employee may appeal to a judge of compensation claims for reimbursement when the employer or carrier withholds payment in excess of the authority granted by this section. So the reimbursement there is obviously going to the provider, um, or there are a few instances where an employee, for example, if you do your first, this is getting in the weeds, but if you do your first exam and the, it hasn't been approved and you have to pay out of pocket, you can come back and get it. And there can be some things with uh, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, but it's clearly talking about paying for the services or, or goods. And um, most importantly, it doesn't support that the department has jurisdiction. It says it's in a completely different agency. All right, Council, I'll do go ahead and sum up in about 15 seconds. 
Uh, we would uh, ask the court to uh, affirm the decision of the second district reversing the orders below that granted um, motions for judgment on pleadings. And thank you uh, all of you for your time today. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. I'd like to start with a couple of the points on which Mr. Gowdy and I agree. Uh, one of them is that we both agree that this claim only exists because of the workers' compensation law. That was the question of a series of questions that Justice Muniz asked. This, the gravamen of this claim is that the workers' compensation law was violated when a bill was sent to Ms. Davis rather than the carrier. That's the basis of this claim. The second thing on which Mr. Gowdy and I agree is that language does matter. So Justice Curiel, in response to your questions, if you look at uh, subsection 11A of 440.13, one of the things that you are exactly right on this, one of the things that is specifically mentioned in that section is instances of improper billing. The department has the authority to investigate and monitor instances of improper billing. And that's why when I read the rules earlier, this is the language matters here too. The language of the rule 69L 34.003, a person like Ms. Davis may report a violation to the Office of Medical Services and among other things, may attach the copies of collection letters that she received from the provider or the or the debt collector. There's really no clearer indication that that statute and instances of improper billing and the de department's responsibility for it sits exactly within uh, the context of this case. So if and I want to make a- In this case, you had the uh, workers comp uh, carriers actually paid the providers and they're paid. But in spite of that, they uh, improperly billed uh, the patient and, uh, when told that they shouldn't be billed that and it had been paid, they ignore that, send them to a bill collection, threaten to uh, destroy their credit, and in fact do that and destroy their credit. There's no other recourse except to go back to a state agency for the patient. I, I think Justice Polston, the, the answer is is uh, the, the agency, there is recourse at the agency, but I want to make sure that that means, uh, I want to make sure you understand that doesn't mean there's no remedy. The agency has the power and the responsibility here in that instance that you're talking about. It can impose substantial financial penalties on a provider. It can disqualify the provider from participating in any workers' compensation services from, from there on. It can refer the provider for licensing proceedings. There are actually very powerful penalties. But there's no, but no direct, but, but if I'm understanding the list of things you've gone through, there, there is no remedy, no direct remedy that will be of direct benefit to the person who has been injured. No, and that's the last point, Mr. Chief Justice, that I wanted to make, which is that the, the workers' compensation law in this state is designed to be an efficient, self-contained apparatus. And one of the trade-offs that gets made, and you see this in the statement of legislative intent, is that employers and employees and carriers all give something up. There is a remedy here. It just doesn't flow directly well, to but, the status. You know, I, this, this whole argument about the purpose of workers' comp, I, it just, I, I find mystifying because... I understand that this administrative process is set up to cut, cut down on litigation of matters, disputes between uh, the uh, providers and the carriers over all that, all those things that are within the scope of the statute. Um, this is something, this is a, a dispute that arises from something that is, a, a, that is expressly ruled out by the statute. Uh, assuming that the facts and the complaint are true, it's something that's expressly outside the workers' compensation system. It's something that is prohibited. And so I don't, I, the, the idea that somehow this is going to protect your, vindicating your position protects the workers' compensation system, I think it's just it's detached from the reality. So what am I missing when I think that? I think, Mr. Chief Justice, what, what you're missing is that that argument simply turns back on itself. The, the, as Mr. Gowdy conceded, the reason that this complaint was filed was because the provider improperly billed Ms. Davis rather than insurance carrier. So yes, but, the insurance the, carrier the, actually the, is supposed to handle the, those bills. Counsel, the trade-offs, all the trade-offs you talk about when you're talking about the workers' compensation, that is not implicated in this, this uh, alleged wrong done by the provider to this uh, patient. I don't see how that is at all implicated by the trade-offs that are underlying the workers' comp system. 
Mr. Chief Justice, my point was that this entire system, including the exclusive jurisdiction provision, is designed to capture all of those trade-offs in one self-executing efficient system. Ms. Davis had recourse to the agency in order to bring a complaint, to get penalties assigned against these providers, to disqualify them from future workers' compensation proceedings, whatever in the case of all of these hypotheticals we're talking about would take place. But what Ms. Davis chose to do was something that is outside of the capability of the Article V courts of this state, which is to sue under the consumer uh, collection laws. Ms. Davis had a recourse. The recourse was designed in a specific way. The statute makes sure that that recourse is exclusive within the department, and that's where this should stay. If there are no further questions. All right. Thank you, Council. We thank both of you for uh, your arguments in this case. And that uh, concludes this session of court.